All right, no pressure at all, but I did hit the record button, so whenever you're ready. Perfect. This is all getting cut out. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Monster of the Week. I am Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and joining me today is Wally from the Wally DM channel. We are going to be talking not just about a monster, but we've actually got a pretty complex puzzle and trap that Wally's going to talk to us about today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about today's trap, Wally? Absolutely. So water traps have always been fascinating to me. And today our adventurers are going to be going through not one, not two, but three different levels of a water trap. And Josiah has got the monster that is going to try to stop him. I'm very excited about this. Thanks for having me on the channel. And I can't wait to uh, share this with everyone. Yeah, I'm super excited to kind of take a deep dive in the most literal sense of the word into today's monster. And if you've ever been afraid of getting catfished literally, then this is the creature for you. So I'll be back to talk to you guys a little bit more about the monster pretty soon. But first off, Wally's going to take it away and kind of give us some information about just exactly what type of trap and puzzles we might be dealing with. Fantastic. Let's get started. So in this puzzle, our characters enter into this very large square room. Now this room has a few puddles in it. It's very damp. The floor is wet and there are several different storm drains embedded into the ground. Now scattered randomly about are a bunch of bones. A lot of them are humanoid skeletons and they even have some of their remnants of rotted leather or rusted plate mail. Most of it is damaged beyond repair. But if the characters were to search these remains, they are going to find three potion bottles. Each potion bottle is labeled as a potion of water breathing, but two of them are empty and only one is full. Other than that, there's not a whole lot left on the first level, but the characters will see five foot tall stone platforms that kind of form a spiral staircase that goes up to the second level. Now it is up to you as a DM as how high you want to make this. For the purposes of this puzzle video and my limited supply of Atari cartridges, we are going to make each of these five feet. Now with regards to level two, the characters can actually look up from level one and see a large hole in the floor. In fact, they can see all the way up this tower. And on the second and third floor, there's really nothing left of it except for a five foot walkway that goes around the entire perimeter of the room. Now, once the players decide that they'd like for their characters to ascend the stone staircase, then we are going to start making some athletics checks. Since this is about five foot tall, it is going to take their entire action to try to climb this. And let's set this probably about a DC 13 athletics. So this character here, for example, rolls a 14 and successfully climbs one of the platforms. Now, as soon as this happens, the entire area is going to start filling with water and it is rapidly going to start filling with water. All of the storm drains, water is going to start coming out of that. Water is going to start coming down the sides of the walls. And before we know it, the characters are going to be knee deep in water. So let's assume that the characters are now going to try to get out of here as fast as they can. We have our two fighters that make their way up these stairs. We have our monk and our tabaxi coming over trying to get up there as fast as they can. And while all this is going on, let's say the water now gets up to here, up to about five feet. Our characters go up again. Now, once the water gets to be about 10 feet high, then all of these grates are going to open and coming out of these grates are going to be two large stalking catfish. So the water is now 10 feet high. We have two large stalking catfish out there. And it's at this point that everyone needs to roll for initiative. Now on initiative count 20, the water is going to go up another five feet. Again, this water is filling this area fast. But before we continue with the puzzle, let's turn this over to Josiah so he can tell us exactly what's going on with these stalking catfish. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction to the first part of today's puzzle, Wally. And of course, before we move any further, we need to understand just exactly what makes these catfish so deadly. The first thing you need to understand about these creatures is that unlike most 
fish, they are amphibious, so they can actually go between land and water. Of course, they're going to be much swifter in the water because they have a swim speed of 40 feet, and I mean, fish. But when they do make it onto land, they have a movement speed of 15 feet, which I mean, it's pretty good for a fish. And while that does sound adorable in a sort of Darwinian kind of way, these fish are of course large sized, meaning that they're as big as a horse. Suddenly that might seem a lot less cute and a lot more horrific. But if everything goes the catfish's way, it's never going to step fin on land because it's going to be able to knock our adventurers into the water. And how is it going to do that? Well, it is going to use its pressure spit action. This is exactly what it sounds like is a ranged attack, and if it hits, it causes a small amount of bludgeoning damage, but most importantly, it knocks the target back up to 20 feet. If that target is still on land, they are also knocked prone, but in the case of our trap here, they're likely to be knocked off the platform into the water where the catfish can then start a feeding frenzy, so to speak. Now, unlike most catfish in the real world, the whiskers on these things are actually quite dangerous. When they get up close and personal, they're going to use their shocking barb attack to try to smack someone with one of those front-facing whiskers and also electrocute them. This is basically the equivalent of getting smacked with a rubber hose with an electrical current going through it, so as you can imagine, you're gonna take some bludgeoning damage and some lightning damage. It's a pretty bad time overall, and if you fail your saving throw, then you're also paralyzed for a turn. And I mean, being paralyzed sucks, but being paralyzed when you're in the water and a catfish is trying to swallow you is just one of the worst things I could imagine. And in this hypothetical situation, if our catfish friend is able to successfully paralyze its target, it can then also make a bite attack for free. When this thing makes a bite attack, like pretty much every other creature with sharp teeth in the game, it's going to cause some piercing damage. But unlike most other creatures, it's also going to force that brave adventurer to make a saving throw. Strength is going to be our ability of choice here, and if the player fails that strength saving throw, they are also swallowed by the catfish. A swallowed creature is going to take a bit of acid damage at the start of their turn, and they're also restrained and held within the catfish's belly. They are, of course, able to make a strength saving throw to try to force their way out of that catfish and make it barf them out back into the water, but at the end of the day, this is just a horrible scene for anyone who fails even one of those saving throws. Best case scenario, you don't get hit at all and knocked in the water. If you do get knocked in the water, you're going to at least want to try to make that saving throw to not become paralyzed. If you do become paralyzed, this is where things start to get really bad, but you can at least try to make that strength saving throw to not get consumed by the catfish. At least, you can if the catfish only attempts to bite you. Because if you're paralyzed, you automatically fail strength and dexterity saving throws, meaning you are getting gobbled up for show. Long story short, you do not want to be near any body of water when these things are around, especially if they're hungry. And if your party does manage to survive everything the catfish has to spit at them, they're not completely out of the woods just yet. So I'm going to pass you back to Wally to explain the rest of this puzzle trap hybrid. Okay, so let's finish off the puzzle, but as you can see, these stalking catfish are monsters in combat. So as the DM, it's going to be up to you to determine how many there are, how high your platforms are, are they going up 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet or more, and how many opportunities that these catfish are going to be able to attack your adventurers. But with that in mind, let's get back to the puzzle. So here we are, the water's up 10 feet. The characters are starting to fend off these catfish. Perhaps this character here gets all the way up. Our tabaxi's a quick climber, he gets up there. This character goes up a level, and this character goes up a level. So if the characters are able to outpace the catfish in the rising water, then the catfish are gonna use their pressure spit ability. And if this one here nails the monk, the monk is gonna tumble down into the water and is now going to need to try to swim back up and evade these monstrous catfish. Now, of course, once initiative comes back around to the catfish, they'll be able to try to use their bite attack and use all of those nasty abilities that Josiah has already laid out for us. So let's say our characters are able to make their way up to the second level. Now, as previously described, there's only a five foot ledge on these upper levels. The entire middle section is emptied out. But once the water reaches the bottom level of the second floor here, it's going to stop filling up for at least the time being. So what our characters are gonna see on level two, and we'll call this 
area two. So we've got area one here, area two here. So on area two, we have a lever represented by this red thumbtack. And over here on this section, there is a wall that's gonna separate area two and area five, area two being green, area five being orange. And there is a very sealed tight door here that will not be able to be opened from this side, not even by a 132nd level wizard. Now then, there is also going to be another set of stone platform stairs that are going to go up to area three or this blue level up here. So the characters can go ahead and start climbing up here safely with no issues. And again, area three up here on top is just going to be a five foot ledge with an open middle. Now, that is to assume that the characters did not pull the lever first. If they did not pull the lever, they'll be able to travel up to area three and look down and the water level is still only up to here. However, if they pull this red lever, then once again, the water is going to start to rise and the stalking catfish are going to start coming up out of the water and chasing them all the way up to area three. It is also important to remember, depending on how you want to run the combat section, that once they are on this ledge, that's not to say that these spitting catfish aren't trying to knock them off of this ledge the entire time that they're trying to look around on area two. But let's say that our characters get up to level three without pulling the red lever. Now the door that they need to get through is this door here, but it is magically sealed by a 145th level wizard and cannot be opened by any means other than to solve the puzzle. Now off to the left of the door is a small indentation and a sign that says passage granted only to the ring of the king. Now they won't be able to get through this section. Again, the middle here is open because they can now see down at the spitting catfish. And now they need to travel over to area four. Now this is just an archway. There is no door here, so they can freely walk through to this side. And there's nothing in particular here on area four to look at, with the exception of there is a ladder that goes down. And right above the ladder, it has an arrow pointing down that says tomb of the king. So our characters will now go from level four down to level five. Perhaps maybe this guy up here stays up, up here to keep guard. And now we're down to this level. So now that our adventuring party has climbed down to level five, this is going to be a little bit of a different floor. The prior three floors had an opening in the middle where they could see down and it only had a five foot ledge for them to walk around. This one, still has that five foot ledge but it is an iron grating that covers the entire floor kind of like a storm drain now if they look down through the grating to the area below this level then they are going to see some skeletal remains well only if they have dark vision if they do not have dark vision then it's just going to be complete darkness but those that can see in the dark are going to see the skeletal remains and as the gm or dm we can allow those characters to make a perception check and if a higher enough perception check is made then they're going to see in those remains is going to be the skeletal hand of the king and it has a ring on the finger so they're going to need to get the ring on the finger of the skeletal hand that is in the lower level of the dungeon and bring it up to the surface here so that they can unlock the door now there could be several different ways that your players can come up with to try to solve the puzzle from this point i put this at 35 to 40 feet down to simply get out of the range of mage hand i believe mage hand has about a 30 foot distance so just beyond the reach of mage hand but there are some other ways that the characters could probably do it perhaps a misty step or some type of a teleportation spell or things of that nature but the way that i would like to see the puzzle solved is if they pull this lever here this door that is sealed that they were not able to open from the other side this lever here actually opens this door and now they can go back and forth well depending as long as they did not pull this initial red lever then they should be able to walk back and forth just fine now once they can walk back and forth all they need to do is to come over to this area here and they need to pull this red lever. And once they do, the water starts to rise. And as the water starts to rise, it runs through this door and into the iron grating and down into the lower level. And again, our, our flood waters are going to raise very rapidly. So water is just gonna be gushing through here. 
and as it starts to rise it's going to bring that skeletal hand with a ring on it all the way up to the top and once it starts to float up to the iron grating one of our characters can then grab the hand and once they have the hand with the ring on it they pull it through and they can climb up the ladder now the water is not going to stop there the water is going to continue coming up so the character is going to need to hurry come over here they're going to need to get the ring off of the hand and then they'll need to press the ring into the indentation to open the door now for the rest of it the dm can decide perhaps once this water is getting up to here our catfish have already climbed up to this point here and as they are trying to get the ring off the skeletal hand then these catfish are trying to spit up through this opening to knock them off and into the water but regardless once they open the door they're able to go through and continue on with their adventure so that's the puzzle that I have for you for the stalking catfish. Now before we turn this back over to Josiah, I do want to ask, what did you think of the puzzle? Is this something that you can use in your game? And if so, what would you do differently? Be sure to leave a comment down below. And don't forget too that if the characters pulled that red lever and that second level is already filled with water and they open the green lever on the other side, that water is going to come gushing through, probably knock out the wall and going to be all kinds of havoc and the catfish are just going to have a glorious meal. So with that being said, thanks for watching on my part and I'm going to turn this back over to Dungeon Dad. This was such an awesome encounter to conceptualize and Wally basically took an idea I had and turned it into something actually awesome. So thank you so much Wally for being on the channel today and talking to us about this crazy encounter that you can throw in pretty much any dungeon. Obviously one that has whatever the equivalent of a crazy cat lady is for aquatic creatures behind its design, but still pretty much any dungeon. Now if you're like me, you've probably got a few encounters in mind for how you might be able to use this creature outside of dungeon or maybe in a different type of dungeon. So of course we're going to talk about some plot hooks and go over some ways that you might be able to actually do that. Now as awesome as the stalking catfish is in this encounter, I think there are a few different ways we could use it, possibly outside the dungeon as well, that I want to talk about too. I mean, at the most basic level, a stalking catfish is just a giant beast. So you can use this thing pretty much anywhere you would just have like a wildlife encounter. If your party is currently on a ship, it could make for a really interesting naval encounter because it's a creature that can live in the water but also come onto the deck of the ship, which is kind of cool. Maybe it just tries to start eating crew members and jumping back into the ocean, which would be horrific. But what's also cool is that they can be used in conjunction with other amphibious creatures, even humanoid or intelligent ones. The first thing that comes to mind is the Sahuagin or even the Kuatoa, one of these kind of fishy amphibian races could absolutely use a stalking catfish in a myriad of different ways. As I mentioned, they're roughly the size of a horse, so these things would make sick mounts. You could literally swim around their underwater cities and also go on the landlocked portions of their city these two. And in that same vein, they could easily be used as beasts of burden or a way of transporting prisoners. If you have prisoners that you've captured underwater, maybe the fastest way to get them to your underwater prison is to simply have your stalking catfish swallow them, bring them to prison, and barf them up in their cell. I would also love to see some type of aquatic ranger take one of these things as a companion. That could be really interesting. And hey, at the end of the day, it's something new for your druid to turn into, which is kind of cool. In any case, that's all I've got on the stalking catfish today, and I hope you found both the monster and the encounter really interesting. I know Wally and I had an awesome time putting this together, and we're very proud of what we've come up with, so hopefully you enjoy it. I look forward to hearing all your stories of how this plays out at the game table and any changes you might make to fit your game better. As always, if you do want to use this creature, there is of course a stat block in the description below, which has everything you will need to run it in the form of a Google document. And if you are one of my awesome patrons, you can get the monster manual style kind of zhuzhed up fancy stat block for all you collectors out there. Also, if you did enjoy this video, there's another one just like it over on Wally DM's channel, which has a whole trap and encounter themed around the Adapter, which is a brand new monster to Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition at least. I'll definitely leave a link to that in the pinned comment below. And thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you like what I do here and you want to keep seeing more videos, liking, subscribing, all that helps more than you could possibly know. Thank you to the YouTube gods and have a fantastic day. Wash your hands. Mm -hmm.